Okay, let's go ahead and begin the, the third and the final talk for this evening. Discipleship. So in the first two talks, we first explored who is Jesus? If we're going to follow Jesus, we first need to contemplate who he is. Jesus preaches the kingdom of God. So we had to take a moment to contemplate what is the kingdom of God about which he is preaching. This then gives us the opportunity to ponder discipleship. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And following Jesus is pretty clearly our call. He comes roaring out the gate to the beach, telling the fishermen, come, follow me. What images we have there. James and John leave their boats. They leave their father behind, running the family business with the hired servants, and they follow him. I think all of us, in having heard this passage many times in Mass over the years and the like, each of us at one point or another has no doubt felt that Jesus is addressing each of us individually, specifically in that moment. Whenever I hear that passage, I know Jesus is calling me to follow him. And when Jesus is calling me to follow him, what does he have in mind? Well, like he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he is first and foremost asking me to repent of my sins, to set them aside, so that I may believe in the gospel, believe in the good news, believe in what he has come to offer me. Now, as we saw from early on, Jesus had critics. And these are some pretty challenging passages to think about. In particular, this idea of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness. And it's whiplash. It's what? Wait, wait, wait. He came to offer forgiveness. What do you mean? So let's think about the context here. Okay? So the scribes said he is possessed by Beelzebul and by the prince of demons he drives out demons. So then Jesus gives the parable of the strong man and tying up the strong man. So as I mentioned earlier, one level of this parable is Jesus is emphasizing he has the divine authority to tie up the strong man and is using that authority and is telling the scribes, I don't have a demon. I have tied up the strong man and I am casting them out having done so. The next part then is a warning. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never have forgiveness. Why is that? Jesus came to forgive sins. And that's been the entire focus of his mission up to here. Looking back to chapter 2, he forgave the sins of the paralytic. In chapter 1, repent is the message. So to claim that Jesus is possessed by a demon is to reject the forgiveness of sins that Jesus brings. Or in other words, 
blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Now, where does the Holy Spirit come into it? Recall John the Baptist. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. He who rejects Jesus rejects everything he brings, rejects his baptism, rejects his baptismal regeneration. Someone so stubborn as to reject everything Jesus offers commits the unpardonable sin of refusing to be forgiven. The forgiveness Jesus offers is conditional on one thing, accepting it freely, right, of our own will. We have this gift of freedom that we can accept or reject what he's offering. And right here, Jesus is giving an important warning to the scribes who are claiming he has a demon. He is saying, by you all making this claim, you all are in grave danger of rejecting your only hope for salvation, which is me. That's the unforgivable sin. So if you repent, you don't have to worry about committing the unforgivable sin. That's good. It doesn't happen by accident. But this is a challenging passage because it challenges us to examine whether or not we're doing that. Am I so attached to my own personal sins that I reject forgiveness? Am I so attached to a particular sin that I won't bring it up in confession? Am I so attached to a particular sin that I won't practice my faith, I won't enter into the life of prayer? We all have to examine our consciences there, and that too is something Jesus invites us to here. For it is the fundamental prerequisite for discipleship. The parable of the sower, of course, is incredibly popular, um, very evocative, very accessible. I mean, the explanation doesn't hurt, but even without that, I would say it's very accessible. Children's Bibles like to include it. But we can think of the parable of the sower as a way of examining the discipleship, the response manifested by the very personalities Mark describes in his gospel. For what we find as we explore these first couple of chapters is that Jesus is calling an awful lot of people to follow him, and they respond to widely varying degrees. So the fishermen, Simon, Andrew, James, John, they're looking pretty good to kick it off. That seed didn't just fall on the path and get eaten by the birds. It fell on something. Maybe it's rocky ground, maybe it's thorns, maybe it's soil. We'll have to find out how it works out for them. But, but that's at least a start, you know? Simon's mother-in-law. What an interesting character. Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. He approached, grasped her hand, and helped her up. And now look at the next part. Then the fever left her, and she waited on them. So her response to healing is to immediately show the attitude of a disciple. She is healed, she recognizes the gift she's received, and she offers what she has in response. And what's the number one thing she has? Hospitality. And she gives what she has, what she knows best immediately is her response. But not everyone responds quite like that. Let's, let's look at the leper. The situation with the leper is a little awkward. The leper came up, begged him and said, if you wish, you can make me clean. There's a bit of a request there, but there's also a little bit of a challenge there. It's kind of like, if you're good enough, you'll heal me. 
Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, touched him, and said to him, I do will it. Be made clean. The leprosy left him immediately, and he was made clean. Then, this is a great phrase, warning him sternly. Let's think for a moment about why he warned him sternly. It's both anticipated and followed. Anticipated, how? If you wish. That was a bit of a challenge. Jesus warns him sternly. Why? Because Jesus perceives that he has been challenged. And so he's saying, if you're going to do this right, if you're going to follow me, you need to do what I tell you, and you need to pay very careful attention. Uh, see that you tell no one anything, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses prescribed. That will be proof for them. The man went away and began to publicize the whole matter. This seed fell on rocky ground, guys. The bird swooped in and picked it up off the path. It's interesting to consider, right? You know, and this idea will be alluded to later in the gospel. But I think we've all had the moment of, Jesus, just give me a sign and I'll do whatever you want. Right? And now you look at something like this, the leper got a sign. He's kind of like, okay, thanks, but no thanks. I'm doing it my way. So Jesus reaches out to us. He does amazing things for us. And then we still often go the other way. Sometimes the seed lands on rocky ground. I've already talked a little bit about the paralytic and friends, but I'm going to talk about them a little more. Obviously, I love this passage, and I've shared with you part of why. What I really want to highlight here is the response of Jesus after they have ripped the roof off and lowered him in. When Jesus saw their faith, just consider that passage. When Jesus saw their faith, he knew just from what they had heard from rumors and the like, he knew they were ready to follow him. And he was ready to give them what they needed. Forgiveness. Child, your sins are forgiven. And you think of the way he uses child here, and it's clearly a term of endearment, even if, you know, because it was a paralyzed man. Child, your sins are forgiven. The mercy of God descending upon him. And we'll see more about Jesus' attitude towards children later in the gospel. But this is very consonant with it. He said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. He rose, picked up his mat at once, and went away in the sight of everyone. Contrast him with the leper, who is immediately before this. So Mark is juxtaposing these two accounts to give us two examples of responding to him. The faithful and the less faithful. You look at this and you can intuit with the paralytic, the seed fell on some good soil. But what about the scribes and Pharisees? We've talked about them a bit. When Jesus explains, as soon as they hear, Satan comes at once and takes away the word sown in them, that's a commentary on how the Pharisees and scribes are criticizing his exorcisms. Satan has come and taken away the seed. They had the opportunity to respond positively to Jesus. They have definitively rejected it in those moments. Perhaps ultimately they may be forgiven. Not the story that we're given access to here. But in the context of the moment, the time, the disposition of their souls in that moment, it is not looking good. It is not looking good. 
One more. Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax collector booth. The guy is at work, and Jesus says, follow me. He leaves the tax booth and follows him. And then throws a party at his house to celebrate. The implication is that he spent some money on it. And it symbolizes that in abandoning his tax collection, he is abandoning the attachment to money that had led him into sin. I foresee some good soil. For the last bit of this talk, we're going to examine the end of chapter 4, the calming of the storm. A violent squall came up and waves were breaking over the boat so that it was already filling up. Jesus was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. These were fishermen, and something that sailors always have is a strong respect for the elements. The sea can turn deadly very, very quickly. And they panicked. And they panicked in a way reminiscent of the leper. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? That's not just a request for help. That's a challenge. He woke up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, quiet, be still. Then he asked them, why are you terrified? Do you not yet have faith? So this is the first test of discipleship that the twelve failed. It won't be the last. It's not difficult to imagine Peter preaching on this, highlighting his own unworthiness for what Jesus called him to, an unworthiness that will only deepen as we proceed in the gospel, but that ultimately cultivates in Jesus' unending invitation for Peter to come to his senses. But this passage, I'm going to suggest, is something that we can all relate to in a very strong way. That is this. Reflecting upon our lives, we can probably all imagine moments, or remember moments, sorry, where we were pretty sure God had abandoned us. It may have been for a short time, it may have been for a long time, but it's part of discipleship. You know, earlier I made mention of the cycle of consolation and desolation. When they responded and left their nets and followed him, that was a moment of consolation. The wonder worker had called them to follow him. Then he institutes them as the twelve. Must have been a peak moment of their lives to have been honored this way. But then the desolation comes in the boat, on the sea, with the water filling the boat. And in the moment of desolation, their faith fails them. And I suggest we can all relate to that in one sense or another. So let me kind of give some concluding remarks about, about the evening. We're, we're almost at 8.30 now. Uh, it's my hope, my intent, of course, that over the next four weeks, 
you're able to take at least some time in prayer, in reading, to really kind of ponder and digest a lot of what all have been going over. Uh, part of why we're spending time reading the gospel is I know how hard it is to actually make time to do something like that. And part of what we're achieving with these four evenings of reflection is just giving you the space to listen to Mark's story about Jesus. But to the extent that you can find time to do so yourself, I really encourage you to do so uh, over the next week. So next week will be similar. Um, we're going to read chapters 5 to 8. We'll pretty much launch with the reading. Um, won't, won't really have an introduction. And then I'll give you a series of talks about uh, chapters 5 to 8. Um, Jesus hits the road in chapters 5 to 8. It's going to be really interesting to explore. So it's been wonderful to have so many of you come out this evening. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to encounter you personally through the medium of the Gospel of Mark. I pray both for myself and all of us assembled here tonight and those that who couldn't be here who may have wished to be here that we have a moment, an insight, sometime over the next week that gives us an ever clear sense of how you're calling us to follow you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you all. Have a great evening. See you next Wednesday.